you take a moment or two and greet a few people around you? The Lord bless you.
Upon your 
going to prepare to receive the Lord's Supper this morning. This is your first time here. You've never operated one of these contraptions before. <laughs> There's a thin layer of plastic at the top that you peel back to get at the bread. And then there's another layer that you peel off underneath that to get at the juice. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 53, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement that brings us peace was upon him by his stripes we are healed and I think first and foremost that's talking about a spiritual healing salvation for our souls but I also think included in that is healing for our bodies I'll explain a little bit later but I need a physical touch from the Lord this morning Maybe you're here and you need one as well. Maybe you're watching and you need one as well. I believe that as we partake of these emblems, maybe the healing power of God will come flowing into your life. Or maybe you're here and you've never received salvation for your soul. This is a good opportunity for you to do that right now. Bible says that all we need to do Romans 10 verses 9 and 10 I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead I will be saved in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 chapter 11, the Apostle Paul lays out the instructions for us for the Lord's Supper. And uh, you don't have to be a member here to partake. The only prerequisite really is that you know Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. But you do have to approach this with a proper heart. A proper attitude. Now, I don't know if I'm the only one in here Sometimes I have a bad attitude. Yeah, I see hands going up. So if we uh, if we've got a bad attitude this morning, it's time to confess that to the Lord. If there's any sin in our lives, it's time to kick it to the curb. And if we've got anything against a brother or a sister or a family member or a member in our church family, it's time to make that right. That text in 1 Corinthians 11 says a person ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. It says that many people eat and drink judgment to themselves if they do it with an improper heart. We certainly don't want that to happen. So before I pray, I invite you this morning to take a moment to do some introspection. Ask the Lord to reveal if there's anything in your life that needs to be dealt with, then quietly confess that to the Lord. Can we do that this morning?
Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you sent your son Jesus to this earth to lay down his life on the cross so that we could have salvation and have a relationship with you. We're so grateful. Thank you, Jesus, for being willing to come. paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the cross. Father, I pray that you would bless these emblems now as we partake. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake of the bread together. Let's partake of the cup. this morning, just, just a couple of announcements. We, uh, our day camp is coming up August the 8th to the 12th. And uh, we're getting some people registered. And it's been out there. I believe in God for 100 kids. All right? I'm asking you to have faith to believe in that with me. All right? Um, so we've got some flyers in the back. I'm going to ask that you take a couple home with you and pass these along to families, okay? Also, um, I know that there's a cost to this, $65 for the week. We've had some very generous people call in to sponsor kids to go to camp from families maybe that that uh, can't afford the, uh, the cost. And uh, so we thank, thank those who have sponsored. And uh, we want to make sure that every, everybody can get in on this. And so if, if that is something that's needed, just please let me know and we'll make sure that your child gets registered, okay? I also need you to be in prayer. Tuesday, July the 19th at 6.30 downstairs, we're going to have uh, a day camp meeting and uh, we're going to finalize some things and I just believe in God for a great week together. And But more than that, we want to minister to families and we want to reach out to them. We want to see many people want into the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, just before we look into the word today, I um, had a little bit of a setback this week. I think it's fitting since we're doing a series on how God turns setbacks into comebacks. So I have a, a tooth that's been giving me some issues. It's broken. Uh, it's scheduled to be pulled out on the 28th. And uh, this past week, uh, a really bad infection set in underneath that tooth, caused my whole gum to swell up like a balloon. I called the dentist and she put me on antibiotics. Friday, uh, I was at home with 102 fever and I was shaking violently. And so Lisa took me to the hospital and uh, they put me on an um, antibiotic IV. Couldn't find my veins. So I was the human pincushion. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Yesterday I was feeling a little bit better, but last night I just felt very weak and was starting to fever a little bit again. So I apologize today that I'm not standing. Um, just not operating on a full tank of gas at the moment. All right? But uh, I'm leaning on the Lord and just believing that he's with me. Amen. Can we just pray? Father, I thank you for your love and your grace. Lord, as we look into your word today, let your word speak to us. Whatever you want to do, whatever you want to say, we open our hearts to you. We pray, God, for those who are not feeling well today. Special blessing on Julie, God. Please touch her and strengthen her. Pray for Kathy this morning, Lord, that you would uh, speed up her recovery on her on her ankle, Lord. And we, we, we also pray for the Strakens, God, that you bless them. Speak to us today from your word. I yield myself to you. In Jesus' name, amen. You brought your Bible with you. I'm going to invite you, please, to turn to Acts chapter 27. Acts chapter 27. We're going to be looking. Uh, we're going to be looking at several verses from that chapter today. We're going to continue our series on how God turns setbacks into comebacks. Now, in each message of this series, we've been looking uh, at a different kind of setback. And how a person in the Bible handled it. And in the first message, we looked at what to do when you've had a setback at work. And uh, how Peter fished all night, caught nothing, and Jesus turned that around. Last week, we looked at the life of Job and what to do when it seems like your setback will never end. And if you weren't here for these two messages, I encourage you to go to our website and watch them. And they'll be a blessing to you. Now today we're going to look at what to do when your setback isn't your fault. Now it's often easier to handle a setback when you caused it by your own mistakes. It feels a lot more unfair when you're going through a setback or through some suffering that were caused by someone else's mistakes or dumb decisions or even by their sins. And those of you have been, who have been deeply hurt by other people, you know exactly uh, what I'm talking about. Sometimes you go through some tough stuff and you're not even the cause of it. Maybe you're here today and you've been the victim of abuse or you've gone through a traumatic event or some other thing. As your pastor who loves you, let me say to you that I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you've been hurt. I grieve with you. These are the major storms of life. And they can wreak havoc on your health, on your hope, and on your happiness. That, and so that's the kind of setback that we're going to consider today. I want us to see how God helps us and turns this into a comeback. In Acts chapter 27, we have an example of how we can suffer because of the stupidness of other people. All right, now this talks about how you need to trust God for a comeback from the setback that was caused by somebody else's dumb decisions. The story of how Paul survived the storm and a shipwreck, and it wasn't his fault. Now I want to give you the background here. The Apostle Paul, his, his deepest desire was to go to Rome to preach the gospel. It was his greatest desire and dream to preach in the Colosseum. Rome was the greatest and uh, most powerful and most influential city in the world at that time. But the way that God took Paul to Rome was not through a preaching series. <laughs> it was through being a prisoner. Paul had been um, unfairly 
put on trial for a crime that he didn't commit. But because he was a Roman citizen, he had a right to appeal to Caesar in capital offense cases, and so he did. And he used his appeal to Caesar to get a free trick ticket to Rome so that he could preach the gospel. Now we're going to pick up a story where Paul is put on a prison ship in Crete. The ship is docked there, and the crew has spent too much time on shore leave. The autumn weather, weather now was turning into winter, and it would be unsafe for them to sail. So God tells Paul to warn the captain of this prison ship that they should wait until winter is over, and then they can sail more smoothly in the spring. But you know what happened? The whole crew gets impatient, and they didn't wait. They would sail into a massive storm. They would be shipwrecked. They'd all likely die. They ignored Paul, and in so doing, ignored the word of God. Acts 27, verse 41 says, But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow stuck fast and would not move, and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. Now this is the story of one of Paul's shipwrecks. I don't know if you've ever studied the life of the Apostle Paul, but if you do, you'll discover that he had three shipwrecks. Now what does this story have to do with you today? It answers three very important questions. What causes people to make bad choices that create setbacks and storms for other people? That's covered in this passage. Second, what do you need to know about the storms and the setbacks that aren't your fault? And then third, what do you need to remember when you're in a storm that's wrecking your ship and making you feel hopeless? All right, so let's go through this this morning. First of all, what causes people to make bad choices and dumb decisions that cause setbacks and storms for other people? Well, in this passage, three things stand out. First of all, um, we, we cause storms for other people when we listen to ungodly advice. And this is verses 9 and 10 of Acts 27. Much time had been lost and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the Day of Atonement. So Paul warned them, men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. I apologize, but I don't have a PowerPoint to go with this this morning. Been uh, tied up in other things <laughs> this week. Now, have you ever been given bad advice? Yep. Okay, so why? Have you ever been overruled by an expert? <laughs> Have the so-called experts in your life always been right? No. <laughs> you know, some people use experts to violate or to uh, validate their biases. They go around talking to experts until they find an expert that agrees with them and then they listen to that expert. So they really don't want advice. They want somebody to reinforce what they already want to do. Now listen, when God tells you not to do something, ignore all the experts who tell you to do it. Now listen to God. If you want to hear from God, you've got to be in his word. People make stupid choices and poor decisions when they listen to ungodly advice. Secondly, we cause storms and setbacks in other people when we copy the crowd. In other words, when we do what is popular, when we go with the flow, when we say, well, everybody else is doing it. Verse 12, and since Fair Havens was an exposed harbor, that's where their boat was docked. 
Uh, uh, and the text goes on, a poor place to spend the winter. Most of the crew wanted to go on to Phoenix, farther up the coast of Crete, and spend the winter there. Phoenix was a good harbor with only a southwest and northwest exposure. It's funny how 2,000 years later, people still go to Phoenix in the winter. That's a different Phoenix. <laughs> History shows that the majority is often wrong. We see this in so many accounts in the Bible. A little later in the text, it tells us that there were uh, 276 people on this boat. That means that when they took a vote, 273 of them voted to stay along and three of them did Paul and his two companions. They got outvoted. Paul gave them the word of the Lord, but they were unbelievers and they wanted to get to Phoenix to spend the winter there. Why? It had a better harbor. And so what happened? They sailed into a storm. They got shipwrecked. Now let me ask you, do you know anybody who shipwrecked their life because they followed the crowd? You know, we see it every day. As people cause problems in other people's lives because they follow ungodly advice or they follow the crowd. And then thirdly, when we rely on circumstances instead of on God. And that's the next verse. We're going to get into trouble and we're going to get other people into trouble when we rely on our circumstances rather than on Christ. Just because something may look good doesn't mean that it is good. Verse 13. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity, so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Have you ever thought you were getting exactly what you wanted and then later realized that you were headed right into a storm? And that's what happened here. That's another question. Is it possible that what you think you want in life just might be setting you up for a shipwreck? When we pay attention to circumstances, we're not listening to what God says, and then we get ourselves into trouble. Now they felt a, a gentle breeze. And they thought this was their opportunity to get the ship in close to the harbor. Now, if something looks favorable and God has already said no, if you disobey God, you're going to sail right into a disaster. I should never trust my circumstances. You know why? Because they change constantly. And they change immediately. Check out this next verse, verse 14. But the weather changed abruptly. And a wind of typhoon strength called a northeaster burst across the island and blew us out to sea. The Gilbert paraphrase of that. Houston, we got a problem. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're trying to go up the coast to Crete and now a hurricane wind or a typhoon strength wind blew them back out to sea and now they're at the mercy of this storm by the way they were in this storm for 14 days so listening to ungodly advice Copying the crowd, relying on circumstances will always get you in trouble and will put other people in trouble. Okay? Now, second question we're going to consider today. What do I need to know about the storms? What do I need to know about the storms? Now, this is very, very important because if you don't know what the storms and the setbacks can do to you, you'll likely be manipulated by them. So it's very important that you know what storms do to your life so that you don't fall for those traps, okay? 
So let me share three traps uh, that storms in your life set for you. And if you're not careful, you fall into them. Number one, storms can cause me to drift from my goal. Storms can cause me to drift from my goal. Verse 15, it hit the ship, and since it was impossible to keep the ship headed into the wind, we gave up trying and let it be carried along by the wind. This verse is packed with insight, by the way. They lost control, and eventually they stopped trying because they got tired. They were then driven by the pressure. And finally, they were drifting away from their goal. And that's what happens when you get into a storm. I don't know if you've ever recognized these things in your life when you face a storm. That little voice in your head that says to you, why do you keep trying? Just give up. Why put in all the effort? It's not worth it. Those are all things that we go through when we walk through the storms of life. So let me ask you this. Have you let storms and setbacks cause mission drift in your life? Have you lost your focus? In storms and setbacks, we foolishly try to control the uncontrollable, but we can't. Verse 17 says, and, and you just try to picture this, they're in a violent storm. I don't even know how this would even be possible. Verse 17, they tied ropes around the ship to hold it together. Uh, it's a hurricane, hurricane force winds. The ship is being battered back and forth. They try to hold it together with ropes. I don't know how they would do that in that kind of storm. Because tying a ship together with ropes would be difficult to do in good weather. They were desperate. A feeble attempt at trying to control a situation that they have no control over and they're operating out of fear. What have you been doing to hold it all together? When you're in a storm, you need to count on things falling apart. And if you're not careful, you can begin to drift. The next thing is, is that storms can cause me to discard what I used to value. Storms can cause me to discard what I used to value. Your priorities and your values often change when you're in pain. They often change after a setback. When you've been in pain, some stuff just doesn't matter anymore, and then other things matter more to you than they ever have. Now here's an example of this. If you've had a long-term illness that has lasted for a long time, you value your health a whole lot more than you ever did. Verses 18 and 19. The next day, as gale force winds continued to batter the ship, the crew began throwing cargo overboard. The following day, they even took some of the ship's gear and threw it overboard. So first, they threw out the cargo trying to lighten the ship. Then they threw out the ship's gear. So that's the equipment that is used to run the ship. A little later in the story, they even contemplated throwing themselves overboard. I mentioned all of that to say that when the storms of life pound against us, they not only cause us to drift, but they can cause us to discard things that are valuable to us. And I want to give you this. Never make major decisions when you are depressed. You'll get into trouble. This leads to the next thing. Storms can cause me to despair. So you see the progression there, or the digression. Verse 20, the terrible storm raged for many days, 
blotting out the sun and the stars until at last all hope was gone. They're adrift in the ocean without the sun or the stars to guide them. They have no idea where they are. They threw their cargo and all their equipment overboard. They lost hope. The last thing that they gave up was hope. It's been said that you can last for two weeks without food, two or three days without water, and we can't last two minutes if we have no water. Now the amazing part of the story is how different Paul's reaction is to the rest of the crew and the prisoners on this ship. Everybody's panicking. Paul is at peace. Everyone else is in despair. Paul is confident and calm. And the true test of faith is not how high you jump while you're singing praises to God, but how straight you walk when you're in the crucible. So how do you react to storms and setbacks? Remember, this storm, this disaster is not Paul's fault. He wasn't disobedient. He hadn't done anything wrong. He's a prisoner on his way to Rome. He heard from God. He told the captain not to go. He told the captain that God told him that if we sail now, we will hit a bad storm and we will shipwreck. But Paul is still filled with hope while the rest of the crew was in despair. What was his secret? Well, that leads me to this third question that we're going to consider this morning. What do I need to remember when I'm in a storm that is wrecking my ship? You know, there are some very early Christian symbols that even were around before the cross. You know, one was the fish, right? The ichthys. There was even a symbol that's older than that. You know what it was? It's an anchor, that's right. An anchor. <clears throat> Hebrews 6, verse 19. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. And so we need to remember the same three things that Paul remembered in this passage. And these three, three things are like anchors that will give us stability in the most unstable situations. These are stability anchors, okay? So the first thing I need to remember when I'm feeling hopeless, number one, remember that God is with me and has never left me. God has never left me. And I'm gonna tell you this today. If you're feeling apart from God, he has never left you. Never once has he left you on your own. He's never abandoned me. And it doesn't matter how dark or how crazy life is, he's always with me. Verse 21 to 23, after they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and this loss. It's Paul's way of saying, Hold your soul. <laughs> All right. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. How does he know this? Paul says, last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me. You know, we can't see God physically with our eyes, but right now, he is standing beside you. Amen. God is omnipresent, which means that he can be everywhere all at once. And I don't know what you're going through right now as you hear me say these words, but I do know this. 
God is with you. He has never not been with you. And you say, well, I don't feel him. Well, that's got nothing to do with your feeling. It has everything to do with the reality and the truth of who he is. And he has said that he will always be with us. And he will never leave us nor forsake us. Amen. Almost felt like standing up and kicking my leg on that one. All right. Listen. Always, always, always remember the presence of God. He's standing beside you. Whether you feel him by you or not, he's there. And this is an anchor that will keep you stable in the storms of life. Here's the second one. You need to remember that God's purpose is greater than this setback. We sing it here. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. Our God is higher than any other. Yet when we go through storms, we don't believe it. Come on, somebody. Our God is greater. His purpose is greater than this setback. Amen. God's purpose for my life is greater than any storm that I'll, that'll ever go, that I'll ever go through and any setback I ever experience. And I don't know about you, but that gives me hope. We see this in the next verse. Verse 24. And he, that would be the angel of God standing by Paul, said, Don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. And what's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. Nobody's going to die even though there's going to be a shipwreck because they're with Paul. And on behalf of Paul's faith, God spared the lives of the rest of the crew. Now you need to think about this. If God's presence is always with me, that means that, that the storms and the setbacks of life can never separate me from the love of God. And if God's purpose is always fully working in me, then storms and setbacks cannot change God's purpose for my life. Doesn't matter what you're walking through at this moment. It doesn't change the fact that God's presence is always with you and his purpose for your life never changes. God takes the good, the bad, and the ugly and he fits it into his purpose for my life. <clears throat> Even my own stupidity. Or even when somebody else's stupidity gets me into trouble. All right, the third anchor. You need to remember that God's promises can be trusted. This is the next couple of verses, verses 25 and 26. Paul's speaking. So keep up your courage, men. For I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. Now, notice where Paul's faith is. He said, I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. He is trusting in God's promise to him. But he also said, our life, he said, our lives are going to be spared, but this ship is done. We're going to be shipwrecked, and we're going to be on some island. It actually ends up being the island of Malta. Now it's very important. If you're in a storm or a setback right now, you need to listen to me. God has not promised to save your ship. He's promised to save you. You may lose the ship. In this story, they lost a ship. Now the ship can be representative of anything that you're trying to hold on to. Your job, your status, your position, whatever. He hasn't promised to save that. He's promised to save you. Isaiah 55 tells us 
that God's ways are higher than our ways, and God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And I don't care how high your IQ is, his ways are higher, his thoughts are higher, and he knows better than we do. He's a big picture God, and he knows the end from the beginning. Sometimes we can only see what's right in front of us. Especially when we're in tough times, we can't see the big picture. Verse 30 to 32. In an attempt to escape from the ship, <laughs> the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending that they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Just picture this for a second. These sailors are on this gigantic ship in the middle of the storm, and they lower a little rinky-dink lifeboat into the sea, thinking that's going to save them. <laughs> then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. What is, it? what is all this about? This is about trusting in God's way. Sometimes we think that our plans are better than God's. So we do our own thing, and all we do is dig a deeper hole. <laughs> we have to have faith in God's way. One of my favorite songwriters, and he's also a theologian, Michael Card, once said it like this. To hear with my heart, to see with my soul, to be guided by a hand I cannot hold, to trust in a way I cannot see, that's what faith must be. What man-made puny little lifeboat have you been holding on to for your security? You know, some people hold on to their appearance as their lifeboat. Doesn't matter how many plastic surgeries you have, that doesn't last forever. All right? Some people hold on to their money, that doesn't last forever. Some hold on to their academic ability or their athletic ability. Well, listen, pro athletes have to retire far sooner than normal working people. You know, you don't see 50 year olds playing in the NHL. You're holding on to these things. You're putting your faith and trust in something that can be taken away from you. So to have true security, you need to put your faith and trust in something that can never be taken away from you. And the safest place to be is always right at the center of God's will. It's time to trust him. Now notice what happens next, verse 34 to 36. Paul says, I urge you to take some food you need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. I wish that that was a verse that I grabbed onto a long time ago. <laughs> After he said this, he took some bread and he gave thanks to God in front of the wall. And then he broke it and began to eat. And they were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. Now listen. Paul gave thanks to God for his provision, and they were encouraged. There is great encouraging power in gratitude. Your attitude of gratitude will relax the people around you. When they're in the middle of a storm. When you express gratitude to God, they will be encouraged. Arlen, you can come to the piano. Now, this great chapter ends with an amazing comeback. Verse 35. 
verses 43 to 44. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and to get to land. The rest were to get there on planks, is people that couldn't swim, on planks or other pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land safely. Not one of them died. Everybody on that ship was saved because of Paul. Do I dare say this? God wants to use us the same way the people in our lives. He wants to use us to save everybody around us. There are people in your life that are battling storms and setbacks. I dare you to let God use you to bring them encouragement. Can we bow, please? The song that Arlen is playing is the song that Billy Graham used to play in his crusades. He gave an invitation for people to come to Jesus. Now, I don't know where you're all at, those of you watching online. Maybe you just tuned in and you've been here for just these last couple of minutes. I don't know. I just want to tell you right now, friend, Jesus loves you. This song says, just as I am, without one plea, but that I want to shed for me. Thou bidst me come to me. Jesus loves you so, so much. He laid down his life for you so that you could have a way to have a relationship with God. Why don't you say yes to Jesus right now? tell you, when you're walking through the setbacks of life, it's far better to have God with you. <laughs> you can just say yes to Jesus with a simple little prayer. It's called a, a prayer of confession, a prayer of repentance. What we're doing, it's not, not a magic formula. We're just acknowledging with our own mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord. We're believing in our hearts and in our minds that he not only died on the cross for our sins, but he also rose again. And then we ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins. And we make a profession of faith that we're going to follow him. And it'd be my honor to lead you in a little prayer. We about say this after me or Say your own little prayer in your own heart to the Lord. Our Father, I know that I'm a sinner. And without you, Jesus, I have no hope. I believe that you came to this earth to die on the cross for my sins. three days later you rose again today I say that Jesus Christ is Lord over my life today I turn my back on my sinful lifestyle and I follow you Please forgive me of my sins. Be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name. Head bowed, eyes.
eyes closed just for a moment longer. Maybe you're here today. Some of what I said in this message resonated with you. Maybe you're walking through a bit of a setback right now and you feel unstable. You need to put out those three anchors that we talked about. Just put up your hand and say, Pastor Jay, please pray for me. I'm in a setback. I want to feel God's presence. I want to move ahead. Is that you? Yes. Is there any? Yes. Yes. Father, you know the hearts of your people. And I pray right now in the name of Jesus Christ. You are the God of the mountaintop. You are the very same when we walk through the valley. You ordain the sunshine. And sometimes you ordain storms in our lives to teach us how to trust you more. I pray for these dear people right now in Jesus' name. You would be with them in this storm. That you would teach them everything that they need to learn. And that they would walk with you. And that they would have faith in you. And that they would trust you. Bless them today, in Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Well, Lord bless you. Please feel free to, uh, to stay in fellowship with each other. God bless you.